Good morning. Well, good afternoon. It's good to uh, be with you uh, again. It's, it's been a while. My name is Dave Van Drunen. I'm an OPC minister and professor at Westminster Seminary, California. And uh, I'm very happy to be with you again and to join you for worship. As we enter our Lord's presence, please rise. Hear a call to worship from Psalm, 10, uh, Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. Let's pray. O oh, Lord, our Heavenly Father, we have heard your call to enter your presence and indeed, we do so, Father, in obedience to you, uh, in gratitude for this great gift, uh, in joy that as we come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we come on his merits because of his perfect work, by the help of his Holy Spirit. And we know that we, when we come to you in his name, that you hear us, that you welcome us, and that you bless us. And so, Father, we do pray that you would set our hearts and minds upon the things that are above now where Christ is seated at your right hand. We pray that you would take away the distracting thoughts, the sinful thoughts. And, Father, we ask that we would set our hearts and minds fully upon you and upon the grace that has been revealed to us in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us uh, sing together now in response to uh, God's uh, call to, uh, to worship him as we sing the doxology number 567. <laughs> It is certainly a great privilege to enter the presence of the living God. And as we do so, we are reminded of his holiness and our own obligation to be holy as his people. And also, as we do so, we are reminded of our sin. Let me just read uh, a couple of verses from 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, to remind you of uh, God's law as it's summarized very briefly but very beautifully uh, in these verses. Uh, the Apostle Peter says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. As we consider those words, let us turn to our Lord in prayer. Let us confess our sins in expectation of God's mercy for those who seek it. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do acknowledge that you are a God who is high and lifted up. You are a God to whom the angelic host sings, holy, holy, holy. And we know, O oh Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us and have called us to be holy as you are holy. And Father, as we consider your calling, uh, we recognize that we are a very sinful people. And so we turn to you again, O oh Lord, and seek your pardon in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we confess to you that we so often do not have unity of mind. We like to go our own way. We persist in stubbornness to pursue the desires of our own hearts. 
We are much more eager to serve ourselves and to please ourselves than to serve and please others. We pray that you would forgive us for this, O Lord. We pray, O Lord, that you would forgive us when we lack the tenderness of heart and the humility of mind that you have called us to. Father, we pray that we would look upon one another and with compassion uh, see our fellow image bearers, our fellow brothers and sisters. Yet we confess, Father, that so often uh, we see others as burdens uh, rather than uh, as our brothers and sisters. Father, we pray that you would forgive us when our hearts are filled with uh, hatred and desires for vengeance rather than having that humble and forgiving spirit. O oh Lord, we have been so richly forgiven in Christ, and yet how slow we often are to forgive. So, Father, we pray that you would forgive us for these and for all of our many sins. For we confess them to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our great Savior, who has taken all our sins upon himself. We know that it is by his wounds that we are healed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is so wonderful to be reminded that if we confess our sins, that our Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. In Titus chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says that when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Be assured again this day that if you've confessed your sins, in confidence in the work of Jesus Christ, that you stand forgiven before your God. Let us respond to this great gospel message by singing together. We'll sing together number 124 in the Trinity Psalter hymnal, the setting of uh, Psalm 124. Let us sing to our Lord. Surely in the name of the Lord, 
And one of the wonderful things that we do in our worship of God is to join our hearts and our voices together in confessing what we believe in the presence of each other and in the presence of God. So let us confess together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, you may find the words printed on page 851 toward the back of the hymnal. As we confess together, remember that these are uh, words that the Church of Christ has used for so many so many centuries, and so we are joining our voices together uh, with uh, the church universal. Brothers and sisters, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, our uh, offering will be received, and uh, let us also sing together uh, number 167. Number 167. <laughs> before the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, we are glad to be here to hear you call us to worship and to enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Father, as we do so, we do indeed Confess that your arm is not too short to save. And your ears are not deaf to the prayers of your people. And Father, that gives us great comfort day by day. That gives us great confidence to approach you, to declare your praise, to cast our burdens on you, knowing that you care for us. 
Father, how we thank you that we have such a great high priest over the house of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that through a perfect life, he became our great high priest. And through the sacrifice of himself, he has reconciled us to you. And surely, O oh Lord, uh, we uh, worship you this day in his name. Lord, we uh, thank you for the many blessings of this life that you have given to us. Even as we look back upon the past year and now look ahead to this new year, Lord, we know that you have blessed us in many ways. Perhaps the last year was difficult. Lord, perhaps there will be many afflictions in the year to come. And yet we know that even in the midst of many burdens, that you never fail to bless your people. You never fail to give us the grace that we need every day. You never fail to provide a way out when we are tempted. Father, we know that uh, your spirit dwells in your people and he is the spirit of comfort, the spirit of consolation. Father, we pray that you would impress these truths upon each person here, upon every member of this congregation. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, that when we feel anxious, fearful, weak, perhaps even about to fall, Lord, we ask that we might uh, know your grace, that you would strengthen us by your word and spirit, that you would uh, lift up our hearts when they are down, and that you would continue to remind us of your manifold mercy to us in Christ. Father, for those uh, here uh, who are suffering in special ways, perhaps physically, perhaps financially, perhaps at work or at home. Or, Lord, you know the various trials of each one here. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bring whatever it is that is needed, whether it be healing, whether it be reconciliation, whether it be provision of material wants. Father, we pray that you would provide and we pray that you would give us patience that even as you call us to suffer in this life, that we would do so with joy, knowing, O oh Lord, that you sanctify us even through and in our sufferings. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry that you have given to this congregation. Thank you for the pastors, for the elders, for the deacons of this church. Thank you for the many gifts that you have given to them. And we pray that you would encourage them in this new year. Father, we pray that you would build them up in wisdom, in love. We pray that they would be humble and compassionate and industrious as they serve your people. And we pray that all those in this church may also honor uh, their, uh, their leaders, that they would pray for them and that they would offer words of encouragement and gratitude uh, for their service. Father, we thank you for the work of your church throughout this world. We thank you for the missions, missionaries of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And indeed, Father, we thank you for all true churches of Christ throughout this world. Lord, we know that there are many places in this world where your people are persecuted very severely. We know that there are many places, even this day, where your people have gathered under threat of death, of prison, of loss of property, of estrangement from family. Father, uh, we thank you for the courage that you have given them, and we pray that you would give to them a special measure uh, of joy and uh, encouragement in their faith. Uh, Father, we uh, pray that you would uh, also... Uh, bless the place where we live. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the many uh, privileges, uh, for the great deal of peace and prosperity that we enjoy in this place. 
Lord, we uh, ask that you would sustain that and further that. Uh, we pray for our civil officials, that you would restrain their hands from evil, that you would give them uh, some spirit of justice and equity, that they might uh, govern in ways that promote the welfare, the good of, of the people that they are to serve and not their harm. Father, we pray that you would bless the rest of this worship service. We pray, Father, that you would give us a true delight in the people of God and a true delight in you and the ways of your kingdom that we might uh, honor you as we continue uh, to worship you uh, this afternoon. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We turn in God's word this morning to uh, Psalm 119, and we'll be considering uh, verses 145 to 160. I've been uh, working through Psalm 119 in my own preaching the last uh, few years, and I'm, I'm getting towards the end of the psalm, and so I am... Uh, we'll be preaching this morning uh, from these two stanzas uh, toward, the, uh, toward the close of Psalm 119. As most of you probably know, Psalm 119 is the single longest uh, chapter in the scriptures, divided into 22 stanzas according to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So we will be, uh, I will be reading and preaching from the Kof and Resh stanzas. So hear now the word of God, Psalm 119, verses 145 through 160. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love. O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Sends our reading of God's word. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the Holy Scriptures. We thank you that, as we have just read, that the sum of your word is truth. Father, we confess that as your people. They are true, your words are true, and they show us the way of salvation. They show us the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. They show us how to walk before him. And so we pray that you would bless your word to your people. May we hear your word with faith and repentance as we ought 
and may you be richly glorified in your word this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, prayer has always been central to the life of the people of God. You might think all the way back in Genesis 4, at the end of Genesis 4, we read that people began to call on the name of the Lord. And throughout the scriptures, people of faith cry out to God. They confess him and they look to him and uh, they pray. Uh, the Psalms, uh, we have sung from the Psalms. We've now uh, heard a reading from the Psalms. The Psalms illustrate this so well. The Psalms provide an example of the prayers of God's Old Testament people. And we are very encouraged by this. And we, too, we learn how to pray by reading and singing the Psalms. But we are also grateful as the new covenant people of God that we are even more blessed in prayer than our Old Testament brothers and sisters were. We have so many greater privileges in prayer. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ has come and has finished his work of redemption. And on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus said to his disciples that from now on they would pray in his name. And that is a privilege that we have. The Old Covenant people did not pray in Jesus' name, but we do. What a great blessing that is. And we also know that because Jesus has ascended to heaven and sits at God's right hand, that he is praying for us. Even as we pray to our Lord from on earth, Jesus is praying for us in heaven. The old covenant saints were heard when they prayed, and yet they did not have the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh praying for them in heaven. And of course, the Holy Spirit has been poured out in full measure upon us as the new covenant people uh, and helps us to pray even when we don't know what to pray, as Paul explains in Romans 8. So we have so many great privileges in prayer. And yet, even as we rejoice to be the new covenant people and to pray in Jesus' name, how much we have to learn about prayer from texts such as Psalm 119, written so many years before our Lord came. In these verses before us, these two stanzas from Psalm 119, the psalmist says a lot about prayer. He talks about prayer, and he also prays. And as we begin to look at this text, it's helpful to remember the situation of this psalmist. The psalmist never tells us his name. We, can't, we can have theories about who wrote this psalm, but we can't know for sure who wrote this psalm. But we do learn a number of important things about this psalmist in the course of reading Psalm 119. And I want you just to think for a moment about some of the things we know about this psalmist. One thing we know is that he was a sojourner. He tells us that early in the psalm and repeats it. He was away from home. Uh, the psalmist gives us this hint that he was not living in the promised land. Uh, he had been expelled from the promised land, perhaps in the exile to Babylon or at some other point of Israel's history. But he's not living in the land. He's living away from the temple of God. He's living away from that inheritance that God had given to his people. And we also know that this psalmist was a great sinner. He confesses that he had been a rebel against God, yet he had turned and been restored to God's favor. And yet he was living in deep affliction. We see this even in the text that uh, we read this morning, but it's throughout this psalm. He was a suffering servant of the Lord. And we think about this. How relevant this is as we think about the situation to which God has called us as the New Covenant people. The New Testament tells us that we are sojourners. We're not sojourners because we have been expelled from some earthly promised land, but we are sojourners on earth because we are not in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven, but we are living away from our true home, our enduring, lasting home. Uh, we are away from God's heavenly sanctuary. 
that place where our Lord Jesus Christ even now sits and ministers for us. That's our true home, but we're away from that home. And we are a people who suffer. It could not be clear in the New Testament that God's new covenant people will be a suffering people who are called, who are called to follow our Lord Jesus Christ uh, by uh, taking up the cross and denying ourselves. And so as we think about this psalm, these, these prayers and the teaching about prayer of this psalmist, we remember uh, how, how pertinent it is as we seek to be a people of prayer as the new covenant people of God. So let's look first at the Kof stanza, verses 145 through 152. Now, in a sense, the whole of Psalm 119 is a prayer. And also, within Psalm 119, many of the verses contain many prayers. So some of the verses contain statements. The psalmist will, will state something. And many other verses are prayers, short petitions that the psalmist offers up to God. But here, in these opening four verses, verses 145 to 148, you might say that the psalmist is describing his practice of prayer. He's not praying per se here, but he is describing his own prayer life. And notice the verbs that he uses in the opening two verses. Uh, he says, verse 145, with my whole heart I cry. In verse 146, he says, I call to you. He describes his prayers as a crying out to God. His prayer is a calling to the Lord. And one thing that we note is that prayer here for the psalmist, and this is true for us, is that prayer is not simply passing along little bits of information to God. It's not like sending God an email with the things we're thankful for today. We don't send God a memo with you know, requests that we have right now. Prayer, as the psalmist describes it, is crying out to God with your whole heart. It is calling to him. Prayer emerges from deep within. Prayer is something that lays bare our soul before God. We open ourselves before the Lord. Now, different people have different personalities. Some of us are more or less comfortable with you know, speaking our hearts, speaking private things to one another. And I guess that's fine. We have different personalities. But before the Lord... We should all be those who open up ourselves to him. There is nothing that is hidden from the Lord. There is no point in trying to keep things secret from the Lord. We would like to keep certain things secret, certain sins we would prefer the Lord not know, perhaps certain temptations, certain struggles that we would like no one else to be aware of, and yet the Lord already knows and so there is no point to keep these things hidden. God has invited us. He has called us to open up our hearts before him, to lay it bare, to confess our sins, to seek help for our weakness, to offer thanks for all the blessings that we enjoy. And you notice this term that he uses, with my whole heart, this psalmist likes this phrase. He, uses, he used this in the, uh, in the second verse of the first stanza. He uses it again in the second verse of the second stanza. With a whole heart. Early in Psalm 119, he uses this phrase to communicate that his devotion to the Lord is not to be partial, not once in a while. His devotion to the Lord is to be with his whole being. With his whole heart, he is to seek the Lord. And his prayers flow from that wholehearted devotion. Prayers flow from the entirety of our life that we live before the Lord. 
And notice then what he adds in verses 147 and 148. Here he speaks of it in terms of time, but you still get this sense of how holistic our prayers should be. In verse 147, he says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. In verse 148, my eyes are awake before the watches of the night. Both whether it's early in the morning or whether it's late at night, the psalmist is a man of prayer. You might think of 1 Thessalonians 5.17, where Paul encourages the Thessalonian church to pray continually, to pray at all times. And of course, we don't literally pray at every moment. Right? There are lots of other things we have to do in life and we can't always focus our minds on prayer. But there is a sense in which the people of God are to be praying always because prayer is to characterize us. It marks us as the people of God. If you are asked to describe somebody, right, you would not think of something that this person does once in a while. You wouldn't think of a character trait that this person occasionally exhibits. No, if you had to describe someone, you need like a word or a phrase, you would think of something, you would say something that mark that person on a regular basis. And the psalmist is getting at the fact that for Christians, we are characterized by prayer. We are a praying people. Prayer is the most important thing to us. It is a way of life. Even as the psalmist says these initial things about prayer, Verse 149, the next verse, tells us something so important. The psalmist seems to set a very high standard uh, in the opening four verses that he talks about prayer. But notice in verse 149 that he reminds us that it is not because of how good our prayers are, about how often we pray, or about how honest we are before God as we pray. That's not why we're heard. We are heard because of the goodness of God. It is the grace of God that explains why God listens. Verse 149, he says, Hear my voice according to your steadfast love. O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. We have no wisdom of our own to find our way to God, to find the place where he dwells. We have no righteousness of our own by which we impress God and make him want to listen to us. But we are reminded here that it is God's grace. As Hebrews chapter 10 uh, puts it, uh, we, there has been a new and living way opened for us through the body of Christ. Through that broken body of Christ, the way into God's presence has been opened up. And we may approach the throne of grace with boldness. It is through that grace of Christ that we come. It's interesting the two words that the psalmist uses here. God hears our voice according to his steadfast love. This is a word that describes God in his faithfulness, his loving kindness to his covenant people. He made promises long ago. This psalmist, however many millennia ago he lived, he knew the promises of God to save his people and God has kept that promise in sending his son. He also uses the term for justice. And this might not sound right at first. Do we really want God to treat us according to his justice? That sounds a little frightening for sinners, doesn't it? And yet, because of God's steadfast love, because Christ has come and purchased our salvation, it is just for God to hear us when we pray. God would be unjust not to hear us when we pray in the name of Jesus Christ because Christ has done everything necessary to reconcile us before our Heavenly Father. Now, as the psalmist draws this stanza to a close, 
he plays in verse 150 and 51, he plays with the idea, this idea of nearness and distance. Let me read these two verses, 150 and 151. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law, but you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Now, this tells us something else that is important to remember about prayer. We pray to God out of need. We pray to God out of weakness. I mean, if we weren't needy and weak, why would we pray? God doesn't have to pray because he is self-sufficient. He is all-powerful. He doesn't need help. But we're not. We're sinful. We're helpless. And when we go upon our knees and seek the face of God, we are acknowledging that. And also prayer in a, it acknowledges that in a certain sense, God is distant. God is in his holy temple. Christ has ascended to his heavenly sanctuary. We are still on earth. We are sojourners. And in prayer, we pray out of a sense that we need the presence of God. We lack the presence of God in this world in a certain sense. When we, when we get to glory... We will worship the Lord, but we will not pray in exactly the way that we pray now. When we will be sinless, when we will be in the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for now, we pray. We pray as those who are sojourners in this world, away from the heavenly temple of God. And you see how the psalmist is drawing upon this idea in verse 150. Who is drawing near? Well, it is the persecutors. This psalmist is someone who knows affliction. He knows trouble. And his persecutors are drawing near to him. And this is even scarier than it sounds uh, when the psalmist goes on to say in verse 150, they are far from your law. Here are these persecutors who are drawing near to the psalmist and yet they're very far away from God's righteousness, from God's goodness. And yet, as the psalmist prays, you see what he goes on to say in verse 151, but you are near, O Lord. Even when he has this sense of evil people pressing in upon him, he prays to the Lord, and it's as if that distance between God and his people vanishes. God draws near to his people as they pray to him. When we pray, we commune with the Lord. We have a sense of the Lord's nearness in a way unlike any other experience in this life. We have a foretaste of that intimate fellowship that we will have on that day when our Lord Jesus returns and we live in his presence forever. And the stanza closes in verse 152. Uh, the psalmist says, Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. So notice in these last two verses, the psalmist says two things about God's word. In verse 151, he says that God's commandments are true. And then in 152, he says that God has founded them forever. Two wonderful things to know about the word of God. It is true. There are so many false things, so many misleading things in this world, but God's word is true. And it is not just true, but it is lasting. It endures. There are many things that are true sort of for a time. Things come and go. There are things that are true now and won't be true tomorrow, but God's word remains true. It is no less true today than it was when it was written. And that should be a great encouragement for us. And it is with that that we move to the second of these stanzas, the Raish stanza, verses 153 through 160. And here the psalmist has some new things to tell us, but he continues to 
he continues to have prayer on his mind, you might say. And you can see this already in these opening two verses of this new stanza. Here, the psalmist is not describing prayer, which is what he did at the beginning of the, of the previous stanza. Here, he, well, he simply prays. You might say he, he demonstrates what he was talking about. He is a man of prayer. And now we see him at prayer. And we see that he is, he is suffering. He's praying as someone who is weak, who is helpless in himself. In verse 153, he says, Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. And then in verse 154, he says, plead my cause and redeem me. And this, this term, plead my cause, that is legal language. Uh, the, the psalmist is portraying himself as if he's in court, whether he's literally on trial for something, or this is just a metaphor, hard to know. But he is asking, it's as if he's asking God to be his lawyer. God, be my defense attorney, plead my cause when these evildoers are bringing charges against me. In verse 154, he goes on to say, give me life according to your promise. Actually, three times uh, in this stanza alone, he asks for life. You get the sense that this is, this is not a small trouble he's facing. His very life is in danger. And so the psalmist lifts up this prayer to the Lord and he, he prays in, with this sense of great neediness. In verse 155, he adds to the sense of, the sense of trouble by again uh, coming back to this idea of nearness and distance. In verse 155, he says, salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. So remember in the previous stanza, what did he say? He said that these wicked persecutors, verse 150, they are far from your law. And here in 155, he says, they are far, or salvation is far from the wicked. Everything about God, his law, his salvation, the wicked are far from those things. And this is part of the reason why evil people can be so, uh, so frightening for God's people, so intimidating for the people of God. And yet, even while the psalmist speaks in this kind of ominous way in the opening verses of this stanza, when we look at the middle verses of this stanza, we see the psalmist in a beautifully poetic way, proclaiming comfort for the people of God in the midst of trouble. In 156, verse 156 uh, it's, the, the ESV translation has, Great is your mercy, O Lord. And that's a wonderful statement. It's a true statement, but a little bit more of a literal translation. And I'll explain in a moment why I think this is important. A bit of more of a literal translation would be, uh, Your mercies are many, O Lord. You see, if you say, as the, our translation has it, great is your mercy, it's as if it's saying that, you know, God's mercy is this thing, and it's really, really big. And that is not untrue. But the psalmist point, actually, is that God's mercies are many. It's not that God's mercy is one thing that's big. It's that God's mercies are multiplied over and over and over again. His point here is a bit like uh, Lamentations 3, where the prophet there says, your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Time after time, day after day, the Lord shows mercy to his people. And... This is so powerful, and it's helpful to note this because in the next verse, verse 157, the psalmist uses the same word, the word for many. Verse 156, your mercy is many. And 157, many are my persecutors, 
and my adversaries. You see, the fact that God's mercies are many, it prepares us and it helps us in the face of the fact that our persecutors are many. Does it seem like there are many enemies of the people of God? Does it seem that there are many troubles in life, many trials in life, much suffering in life? What the psalmist is communicating here is that however many the enemies of God are, God's mercies are just as many. There is mercy of God to meet every trouble, every trial, every affliction. You will never run out of the mercies of God, no matter how many trials, no matter how many enemies you face in this life. We can be so anxious and afraid in the face of trials, in the face of enemies. But however many the threats, God's mercies are just as many. May we give thanks to God for that great truth. In verses 158 and 159, as we approach the latter part of this stanza and of our text, the psalmist uses a particular word that is obviously important for this stanza. Uh, let me just uh, pause for a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Psalm 119 is divided into 22 stanzas according to the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so what that means, the way this psalm is constructed, is that, so, okay, so there are eight verses for each stanza, and each of those eight verses in every stanza begins with the appropriate letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So just to be concrete, we're looking at the Reish stanza now. So every single verse, each of these eight verses, begins with the Hebrew letter Reish. Now, there is... Uh, a fairly common Hebrew word that begins with this letter is the word for see or look. And the psalmist actually begins three of these verses with that word. There's no other word that he uses more than once to begin uh, these, uh, these verses. But it's obvious that the word for see or look is important here. The very first word of this stanza Verse 153, he uses this. Look on my affliction and deliver me. He calls for God to see him. And then uh, again in verse 159, he again uh, uses this word. It's translated here, consider how I love your precepts. It just is saying to God, look or see how I love your precepts. So in these two instances, the psalmist is asking God to see him. Now, if God was our enemy, that would be a frightening thing. We would not want God to see us, right? We would want God to be as far away as possible. We want to be hidden from God. But since God is our friend, since God is our Savior, we want God to see us. And in a way, that's relevant for prayer, isn't it? What are we doing in prayer? Well, one of the things we do is we ask the Lord to see. Look upon us, O Lord. Consider us and bless us. But also, in verse 158, he also begins with this word for see, but here he describes his own seeing. It, it's almost as if the, psalmist, the psalmist's seeing is shaped by God seeing him. Because God sees him, he now sees in a certain way. And what he says in verse 158, he says, I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Now, that might strike us as being maybe a little uncharitable, maybe a little self-righteous. You know, he looks at the wicked and feels disgust. Ordinarily, we don't want to, you know, uh, we don't want to tell unbelievers that we are disgusted by them. That's not exactly the way we ordinarily would want to, uh, to interact with them. But there's something important that the psalmist is communicating here. It's not self-righteousness. He's not being uncharitable. He's not giving us an evangelistic strategy here. But you see, one of the great temptations for the people of God is to be envious of the wicked. This can be true of you young people here. You might look at non-Christian friends you know, and it seems like they have fun in ways that you don't have fun. You can't, not supposed to have fun. Or this happens to adults as well. 
we look at the wicked, we see perhaps their prosperity. We see how they're able to succeed in certain ways because they're willing to do things that we're not able to do. And you see, that is a, that is, that is a temptation we need to be on guard against. Let us not find the wicked attractive. Let us not look at their way of life and find it something to follow. The psalmist says, I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. He is saying, O oh Lord, I do not find the way of life of the wicked attractive. It turns me away because it is not in accord with your word. How appropriate then that the psalmist concludes in verse 160 by turning back again and describing God's word in almost exactly the same way as he described it at the end of the previous stanza. Do you remember I noted that in verses 151 and 152, the psalmist says that God's commandments were true and that God founded them forever. God's word is true and God's word lasts. It endures and notice then how he ends verse 160. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Let us this be our confession. God's word is true. God's word lasts. And because of this, we may be confident as we approach our Lord in prayer. We may know that he is near when we call on his name. And we know that his mercies are many to his people who seek his face. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this word, this word of God. Uh, Lord, it is uh, encouraging for us to uh, read these words, these meditations of this psalmist of old. O oh Lord, we may not know his name with any certainty, and yet uh, we know that he was a godly prophet, and he was a man of prayer. And we ask, O oh Lord, that we would learn from him. O oh Lord, make us people of prayer. Make us people who delight to approach your throne of grace. Make us a people who come with confidence, confidence grounded in Christ and his finished work. O oh Lord, may we not hide, hide anything from you as we come in prayer, for we know that you see us. We cannot hide anything from you anyway. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we seek your face, that you would draw near to us and that you would make your mercies abound to us. O oh Lord, in the midst of many trials of life, in the midst of disappointments, discouragements, persecutions. Oh Lord, whatever those trials be, we ask that indeed your mercies would be many, that they would abound to us and that we would be encouraged as we asked that you are a God who answers and blesses uh, beyond even what we can imagine. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, people of God, it is a privilege for us now uh, to approach the table of the Lord to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And as we do this, hear the words of institution uh, from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. People of God, uh, our uh, Westminster standards uh, teach us that the means of grace are the word, the sacraments, and prayer. 
And what this is getting at is that uh, there are certain ways that God has ordained uh, in which he has promised to bless his people. It is through the word of God that he instructs us and encourages us. It is through prayer that we draw near to God and receive his blessings. And we have spent a lot of our worship service thus far with the word and prayer, haven't we? How fitting it is then that now at the end of this service, we get to approach the table of the Lord and to experience also the sacraments, this other great means by which God pours out his grace upon his people. In this sacrament that we are about to uh, participate in, as Paul says here, uh, we remember the Lord's death. We considered, as we were thinking about prayer, as we considered God's word teaching about prayer, that it is through, it was through the Lord Jesus' death that this new and living way has been opened up to us, the people of God. We approach the throne of grace with confidence and prayer because Jesus has laid down his life for us once and for all, one perfect sacrifice for sin. As we approach this table, brothers and sisters, we remember what Christ has done and we are even proclaiming what Christ has done as we receive these elements and as we eat and drink by faith. And yet, please also remember the last part of Paul's statement. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We approach this table in expectation of our Lord's return. Our Lord is coming again. And when he comes again, as he's told us in the scriptures, that last day will be like a wedding banquet. We will sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the saints of all ages. And our Lord Jesus Christ, we will see him face to face. He will sit at the head of the table and serve us, his people. As we gather here and partake of this sacrament, we have a wonderful foretaste of that great feast on the last day. As Paul said earlier in 1 Corinthians, as we eat and drink, we commune with the body and blood of Jesus Christ even now. And so people of God, let us come with faith, repenting of our sins, resting on Christ alone. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11 to give a warning. This is a sacrament that we participate in only, um, only thoughtfully, uh, very seriously. Paul says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. If there is anyone here who does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are not baptized, not a member of Christ's church, either of this congregation or of another church that professes the good news of Christ that you have heard here today, then we, we urge you not to eat and drink as these elements are passed in a moment. We are glad that you are here, uh, but we ask that you refrain from eating and drinking. But for those of you who know the Lord Jesus Christ, who profess his name, who are members in good standing of his church, notice what Paul says. He says, examine yourself and so eat and drink. He doesn't say examine yourself and stay away. Examine yourself so that you might come. Confess your sins. Cast away all confidence in your own righteousness. And look to the Lord Jesus Christ, your all-sufficient Savior. And so come, eat and drink, and be refreshed in your Savior. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this table we thank you for this meal. It is a humble, small meal in earthly terms, but it is a rich feast spiritually. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive our sins, 
that you would set our hearts fully upon Christ and that with joy and gladness we might receive these elements, these tokens of Christ's body and blood and that through eating and drinking by faith we might truly be encouraged and built up in our most holy faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The elements will now be distributed. If you would please uh, hold them, and then when everyone has received them, we will eat and drink together. People of God, on the night when our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after he broke it and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, he said, take, eat, remember, and believe. So now, remember that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for you, take and eat. On that same night, our Lord, after dinner, took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so, brothers and sisters, remember that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for a complete remission of all your sins. Take and drink. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give you thanks that your mercies are so many, O oh Lord. Thank you that we may taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, we thank you for this bread and wine, such humble elements, and yet, O oh Lord, by eating and drinking, we confess that we commune with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this, O Lord. We praise your name for such a great salvation, and we pray that you would encourage our weak and sinful hearts as we partake of this great sacrament. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing uh, hymn uh, this afternoon is number 119T. This is a setting of one of the stanzas that we considered from Psalm 119. So please rise and let us sing 119T.
brothers and sisters, go with your Lord's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace.